All right. So, once again, this class is about macroeconomics. And as I mentioned, what distinguishes macro from micro is that we are studying economic aggregates. And what are economic aggregates? Economic aggregates are things that are the sum of many, many smaller things. Now that sounds kind of vague, so let's get out of vague and get into highly specific. Suppose you had, let's say, an economy, let's just say it's the United States, for example. You wanted to get a sense, let's say, of how much economic activity there is in the United States. Um, what might we want to do? Well, one way in which we might get a sense of just how much economic activity there is in the United States is by trying to get a measure of just how much stuff is being made in the United States. So let's think about how you might try and go about measuring that. Because of course, if we want to talk about something in economics, we also want to be able to measure it. And of course, there are government and other statistical agencies that go around measuring all sorts of economic aggregates, as well as other economic statistics all the time, which we then use to both observe what's the behavior of the macroeconomy, and then, and this is the key part, this is what economics is all about, develop theories to try and understand why that aggregate is doing what it is. Okay? So if you want to measure production, let's try and write down a definition. So we want to write down, I'm going to leave a blank here, okay, for reasons you'll see in a bit. So why don't I start with the word total? How's that? Because we want to be completely comprehensive. We don't want to miss anything. So let's make sure the definition reflects that. So total. Total production of something, goods. Well, first of all, if we want to capture everything, is everything produced in the United States a good? No. What else do we produce? Services. Services, right. So goods and services. In fact, um, more than half of the production of the United States is not service. Sorry, it's not goods, it's services. I am producing a service right now, at least I hope so. Educational services, haircuts, hoteling, financial services, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, social work, healthcare. Um, now, I said, for example, the United States, so what that suggests is that we need to also specify, you know, delineate some location. So in a particular place. And we probably also want, let me write over rather than in, over, specify when we're talking about, right? Because production now, production 10 years ago, we need to be specific over a particular period. So we'll be talking about something like production in the United States in the year 2021. Also, it doesn't have to be a country. It could be a state or a city and so on. Over a particular period. And then I want to leave another blank. So, what's the first blank doing there? The first blank is there because even though I started with the word total, we actually need to be careful about which goods and services we are counting. Why is that? Well, consider this bottle of tea, which is delicious, highly recommended. So this bottle of tea was produced, right? And here it is. But, in, but to make this tea, there are various ingredients that had to go into it. There's the water, right? The factory that made this tea had to buy the water. They had to buy the tea. They had to pay people to do the work to get it all together. They had to buy the plastic that's in the bottle. And so when we're adding up GDP, sorry, 
when we're trying to compute production, I already, I slipped and that's what this is going to be called, but some of you probably knew that already. When we're trying to measure production, um, <clears throat> this is sort of done, right? It's a done good, it's ready for use. Um, and so we probably want to include that. But the water that the factory bought shouldn't be included separately. That would be double counting. The value of that is already in here. So there's a distinction there between goods that are done and ready for use, like this bottle of tea or this computer or this building, versus the components that made it up, like the water in the tea or the brick in the wall or the microchip in the computer. And that distinction is the distinction between intermediate goods, so those are the ones that are components of things, versus final goods, which are done and ready to go, ready to be used. So we're only going to count final goods, because if we counted intermediate goods separately, we'd be kind of double counting their value. What's the second blank? Well, I keep referring to value, um, <clears throat> how are we going to measure these things? We need some measure uh, that somehow is able to aggregate or put together a, a very diverse set of goods, including tea and computers and buildings and haircuts and so on. We need one measure to try and get this all together. And well, what's a logical measure to use? Well, all of these things were made and then um, if something is more valuable than something else to society, well, one way of seeing that is whether someone was willing to pay a lot for that thing versus another. That suggests that the way to measure GDP and aggregate the value of all this diversity of goods is to use the prices at which they're exchanged. And when you put all this together, you get an aggregate which is called gross domestic products, or GDP. Okay. Very good. Now. As I mentioned, economists, particularly macroeconomists, once you've defined a thing, actually we'll be doing this process in class, once we've defined a thing, we'll have a look at some data that tells us about how it works, and then we'll move to the third stage, which is defining, <coughs> sorry, um, understanding how it is that macroeconomists um, try and understand this thing. So, Here is GDP, and what's the unit of measure? If it's for the United States, dollars, right? And as you'll see, macroeconomists are particularly interested in seeing how things evolve over time. So we won't be so much interested in whether GDP is, I don't know, 25 trillion, but we'll be interested in seeing is it going up, is it going down? Is it going nowhere? And so, as you'll see, very often when we're looking at macroeconomic data, the data started in 1947. That's the year when, um, I guess, they started trying to measure things consistently with proper data. And so you could imagine using this definition to measure um, GDP as defined in 1947, you'll get some number, right? And then I could gather the data for 1948, and I'll get another number, I could plot it here. And I could do that for all the years up to 2022. And if I were to do that, I would get an upward sloping line. That's interesting. This is a measure of production. And if I measure production and get an upward sloping line, 
which you would if you did what I described. That would be interesting, right? It suggests that for some reason, the US economy has managed to produce more and more and more stuff over time. If that were true, that would be interesting and something for macroeconomists to analyze. But we actually can't reach that conclusion from this line, at least not yet. Why not? Well, as described, this would represent increases in production over time, but there are actually two completely different reasons why this line might go up. One, as I said, is that maybe there's more production of final goods and services. But what's the other reason why this thing might go up? Even if production of final goods and services didn't change at all, you could still see this line go up. Why would that be? Any ideas? Yes, sir. Yeah. What if the market prices are rising? So this line is actually kind of useless because it's mixing changes in prices with changes in quantities and it's not really telling us anything. So ideally, also, first of all, GDP as described such that it doesn't distinguish between prices and quantities. Or to put it another way, isn't adjusted for inflation. It's called nominal GDP. Nominal anything means it's not adjusted for inflation. Nominal GDP is an example. We would like, instead, some version of this that is adjusted for inflation, right? And, well, what's the problem here? The problem is the market prices are changing and the goods and services are changing, and we would like to distinguish between them. So, one way of doing it is, well, why don't we just keep the prices constant? Why don't we pick a year, an arbitrary year, let's call it base year, and instead of letting the market prices change, we just pick a year and use the prices from that year. Now the prices aren't changing, so any change in this line would be only due to changes in production. If we did that, we would no longer have nominal GDP. That would be a different measure, and it's called real GDP. So in macroeconomics, nominal anything means it's not adjusted for inflation. Real anything means it is adjusted for inflation. Now, the base year is arbitrary. Usually, it's a fairly recent year, so that people have some sense of value, right? But for purposes of this graph, it'll be easy if I pick uh, 1947 as the base year. Now suppose I pick 1947 as the base year. What's real GDP in 1947? It's the same, right? Because we're using the prices from 1947. But, as I think you all know, generally, there is inflation. Generally, prices rise over time, not by much, 2 or 3%, but they do rise. And what that means is that the GDP for 1948 is going to be lower than the nominal, right? And the same for all of these, because this thing is mixing growth and prices with growth. Goods and services, and the other one is not changing with growth in prices, so there'll be a lower line. But if you computed it, it would still be rising, even adjusting for inflation. Nonetheless, we still can conclude that there's something really interesting going on here whereby humans are becoming somehow more productive over time. Because what grows over time that might lead this to go up even if humans aren't somehow becoming more and more productive over time. Yes? Population. Yeah. More humans. Exactly. Population. So, when all is said and done, what we'll be really interested in is understanding the dynamics of, well, I guess, real GDP per person or per capita.
And after all those adjustments, well, rather than telling you, why don't we just look at the actual data for real GDP per capita. So if you look at um, Blackboard, you'll see there's this thing here that says class figures. And there's some data that we may not end up using, but there are a lot of figures there looking at data, and so I'm interested in looking at GDP. So here is GDP per capita in the United States. If you look at the heading, it says base year is 2012. So anytime there's real anything, there has to be a base year, right? Some year for which you're holding the prices fixed. Um, and what do you see? So the blue line is GDP per capita in each of these years back to 1947. The orange line is a geometric trend that goes through all of those, except for 2008. So let's ignore that for a second. If you look back here, one thing is pretty clear. GDP per capita grows over time, usually. Right? And actually, I can show you another figure, which goes back a bit further. Let's see, is this it? Yeah. Um, this goes back, boy, there we go, to the 1800s. There's a green line through it again, right? Just to show you the, the there's this sort of growth over the long run. Look at this. This is a Great Depression. GDP per capita drops a lot. But even so, if you look 20 years later, it's like nothing happened. It's gone back again. So that phenomenon of economic growth over the long run is something that we will be interested in studying as macroeconomists. We'll try and figure out why it is that it happens. And whatever it is, it must be something Resilient, persistent, right? If even big shocks, big crashes like the Great Depression aren't able to derail the process of long-run economic growth. Going back here. That said, if you look at the blue line, the blue line isn't exactly following the orange line, right? Sometimes growth is faster, sometimes growth is slow. Um, and so, aside from the phenomenon of economic growth, there must be something else going on that's leading to these fluctuations around the long-run growth trend, right? So, we'll refer to those fluctuations as the business cycle, and understanding why the business cycle happens is going to be our second sort of big theme of the class. Okay? Now, I said forget about what's happening out here, now let's look at it. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? It's a bit unusual. It looks like starting in 2008, something happened. Um, it's not like the United States stopped growing, but it's like it dropped and then kept growing from that new point, right? At least that's how I see it. So that's not going to be a separate theme, but it is something that hopefully using um, our understanding of long-run growth and the business cycle, something we can sort of analyze using the same tools. Um, one issue that started in 2008 and has kind of continued and was actually reinforced by the COVID lockdowns, which you can see very clearly in this picture, um, is that a lot of people dropped out of the workforce. So then, in a sense, maybe GDP per capita is misleading because there's the same number of people, maybe, but a lot of them left, stopped working. So then it's not necessarily that starting here, <coughs> people became less productive, but rather the people just left. You just quit. So, so it's not clear. It's a debate we can have at some point, right? Is it that there's a productivity collapse starting here, or is it just that a whole, people, um, a whole bunch of people quit? It's probably a bit of both. Right? Anyway, just want to have a look at that. Actually, another way of 
analyzing this growth versus business cycle thing is to look at the actual growth rate of GDP. So before I show you that, um, you should probably remember what a growth rate is from micro or from econ 1001. But just to make sure, make this a bit bigger. We're going to define the growth rate of GDP. And this formula, of course, is fine for the growth rate of anything. It's going to be GDP now, or the, let's say this year. We're going to stick with yearly data. Minus GDP last year. So this is the change in GDP. I'm going to put a little R here, by the way, just to remind ourselves that this is real. And you divide it by where you started. So maybe, how about this? Divided by our real GDP last year. And then if we want to make it a percent, we multiply this by 100. Okay. So that's the growth rate. It's the change divided by where you started, so you get a sense of the proportional change. And then again, the multiplication by 100 is just to make sure that it's now expressed as a percentage. All right? Bless you. So that's the GDP growth rate, the real GDP growth rate. It's the rate of change, the rate of growth. And where is it? Here it is. There. So again, what do we see? Um, it's going up and down. There's our business cycle. Right. But if you look at it, the average is positive. It's only below zero every now and then. Below zero means it's shrinking, right? It means that the change was negative, which means the rate of change was negative. Most of the time it's positive, that's long run growth. And is there a trend, like do we see growth obviously slowing down or obviously accelerating? I'm not sure. Um, it's hard to tell because there's so much noise, right? You can tell that the average is positive. And we all know what this is. We were there. So this is a um, brief economic collapse followed by partial but not total recovery, right? Because the opposite spike isn't as big as the down. So, suggesting we're not quite back here. Now, having looked at that picture um, for a second and identify the topics of business cycle and economic growth, I want to observe the following um, blank screen. Um, what time does class end? Sorry? 12 what? 25? Okay. Thank you. All right. Sorry, it's just the last time I taught this class, it was 50 minutes. Now it's 75. So, um, going back here, remember that. Um, this was nominal GDP, which mixes prices and quantities. And this is real GDP that only reflects quantities. So as discussed, if this grew faster than this, it means there must have been inflation. But if you think about it, it also means something else. It means that we can actually measure inflation <coughs> using the rate at which this gap is getting bigger. right? So we're going to do that at some point, probably next class. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that um, they're very well. They're, as we'll see, there are various ways of measuring what's happening to prices, but one of them is right here, and it's reflected in the gap between nominal and real GDP. So we can measure inflation. That's the point. We can measure what's happening to prices, and I mentioned that because I wanted to show you some data for inflation as well. So where are you, inflation?
This picture is prices. So it's not inflation, right? Inflation is, again, just like we had the growth rate formula for GDP growth. Inflation is the growth rate of prices. So this is just prices. And yes, as discussed, they seem to be going up, 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 up over time. But again, it's a measure of this. You could imagine it's a measure of this gap here. Notice occasionally it doesn't grow, right? Here, it, the prices actually drop. And you remember, looking at where my finger is, as you probably all know, that's when the big financial crisis of 2008, 2009, 2010 happened. And there's a drop here, a little one, right? We all know what happened there. We were there. So that gives some sort of hint that maybe prices drop when the economy is shrinking, which suggests maybe prices rise when the economy is growing. So keep that thought in mind. Now let's look at the inflation rate, which is the growth rate of this. Okay? Just like we looked at GDP and then its growth rate. We're going to look at the price level and its growth rate. This is inflation. And <clears throat> let's see. As we were discussing, it's usually positive, right? Um, occasionally, it's not. There's a dip here. There's a dip in prices here. When prices decrease, we call that deflation. Here's that dip we saw earlier. This little dip here and kind of here. Um, but what about this? Look at the 70s, 1970s. There's huge inflation there. When we were looking at the growth figure, were the 1970s a period of explosive economic growth? No. In fact, that period is known as the productivity slowdown. So, it wasn't, so that suggests that how prices move around must be a bit more complicated than just, oh, prices go up when the economy is growing and prices go down when the economy is growing. So it's, right? Inflation is higher when the economy is growing. Inflation is low when the economy is <coughs> shrinking. Or here. This is where we are now. Again, very high inflation. Is now a time of explosive economic growth? No. So, again, that's a curiosity. So, I mean, it's not a curiosity. Curiosity seem, makes it sound like something um, that we don't understand. What it means is, this is interesting, and it means that how prices move around is going to be more complicated than just, oh, when the economy is booming, prices will go up, and when it's not booming, prices will go down. We'll have to think more carefully, and we'll have to have a more sophisticated understanding of how the economy works, such that you can have prices sometimes rising when the economy is not doing well, but sometimes dropping when the economy is not doing well. It's going to be something a bit more complex. OK? Any questions, comments, doubts? Okay. Yes? So we will, well, we'll get there, but um, there are, I mean, eventually what we're going to do in this class is we're going to develop a theory. So think about the following. Um, GDP, actually, let's back up. When you're in micro, right, GDP, oh, sorry, when you're in micro, when you thought about how markets behave, what do you do? You plot the supply-demand diagram. You have prices here, and you have quantities here. And then you put in demand and supply, right? Not yet, but eventually we're going to do something very similar. The quantity thing that we're interested in is GDP. The price thing that we're interested in is price level. So when prices rise in, a, in micro, it could be for one of two reasons, right? Either there's a lot of demand or supply has gone down. So in macro, using that same intuition, if there's high inflation, what's going on? Either for some reason there's a lot of demand for final goods and services, or for some reason supply has declined. Right? 
So if, let's say, the price of some inputs, your suggestion was energy, I guess, more broadly than just oil, but energy, goes up, that's going to discourage production and could result in inflation. So yes, that's one um, factor, but not the only one. Um, I guess what I mean is this. Suppose, suppose pri the price of a thing rose to a new level, then you'd see inflation on that thing for a period, and then it would stop, right? Once it's reached this new level. But to have sustained inflation over basically a decade, as high as almost 14%, something else is probably going on. Not necessarily that the oil shocks weren't part of the story, but maybe they started something else, right? Because this is, again, inflation year after year after year after year, not just on the two dates when the oil price went up. So it must be a factor that what really the causes of long-run inflation like that must then go, must involve other, other things that could then be caused by that. And um, arguably the same now. I mean, there's certain shortages of not oil so much, although energy markets are a mess, although not in the United States. But um, there are other things that are scarce, that are also inputs, like um, for a while there was a semiconductor shortage, now there isn't. But um, yeah, input price, it seems that input price shocks are a factor of inflation. And, um, but again, as discussed, there's more to the story than just that. So, good observation. Any other thoughts, comments, questions, either about this figure or either of the others? What about our discussion? Not right now. Okay, let's see. If this class ends at 2.25, we have 20 minutes. So I guess there's one more picture maybe I want to share with you. So I am an, I'm a professor, so that means I teach classes. But another part of my job is to produce academic research. And the topic uh, on which most of my, well, most of my acad academic research is about the topic of economic growth. Okay. So, and not just, and the broad topic of economic growth has two parts. One is trying to understand why it is that economies tend to grow over time. And we'll discuss that um, soon. That's the first like, big topic that we're going to look at. But, um, I can find this. Mm -hmm. There's another phenomenon related to economic growth that's what I may be interested in. So the, this this, this um, picture is a little bit dated, but it doesn't contain any information that the updated data wouldn't look any look, wouldn't look very different. And that is that okay, GDP grows by, I don't know. 2% on average, GDP per capita, real GDP per capita usually grows around 2% each year, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. 2% a year doesn't seem like much, although of course it adds up over many years. But look at this. There are colossal differences in GDP per person across countries. And here it's grouped, so of course within Africa there's a lot of variation, within Central South America there's a lot of variation. Um, this is interesting to me. This looks like something worth understanding. Something that if we understood better would make a huge difference to people's lives. So, um, the f so this is, I mean, notice that all the groups of countries are actually growing, right? The issue is that they're not growing closer together, or not obvious. Um, there are some that do, um, but there are many that don't. So understanding why this is, why um, whatever it is that um, causes economic prosperity in I don't know, United States, Western Europe, and some other places isn't um, creating prosperity in other places, trying to understand that is what I think is uh, the most important thing for macroeconomists to understand. Um, and we'll talk about this too when the time comes in a couple of weeks. Any questions, thoughts, comments? Right. So, 
we still have a little time. So um, what I want to do now is um, I'm not sure I can promise to do this every week, but I want to do a quick online quiz to see if everything took root. So please go to this website using whatever device you have, www.ahoot.it, and enter this game pin, and we'll see how we did. No sound for some reason. Why is there no sound? It's very strange. Let's see how many people do we have? Tony Yazer is here. Um, anyone have any idea how why the sound might not be working? It's supposed to be sound. My voice is coming through the microphone. You can hear it. I can't hear anything. Oh, there we go. Study of economic what? Production or costs? Almost there. Production, very good. Next, this one you have to type. GDP measures the production of what goods and services? That was quick. Five, four, three, two, one. The answer is final. 
Very good. Next. They go to his doing best, I guess it's not surprising. GDP values goods and services using what? Market prices. Very good. Next. That is Halfway there. When you buy apple juice, the value of the juice and the value of the apples in the juice are both added to GDP. Is this true or false? Business cycle, inflation, economic growth, or final growth? Is economic growth. Last. Fluctuations in the growth rate of real GDP are called what? Mean business cycle. All right, don't leave yet. We want to see who won, and whoever wins will get a prize. Rototi is third, second, and first is... Ella! Ella. Where's Ella? Well, for everyone else, thanks very much. Look forward to having a productive semester together, and we'll see you next week.